Welcome to the Crypto Podcast. You can find all our episodes on CryptoPodcast.org. We're also on BitChute, and you'll find the links in the podcast description. I forward a podcast, speaking podcast, meditation podcast, learn Polish podcast, and the Crypto Podcast, as well as I'm a podcast coach. So if you'd like to start a podcast, you know who to contact. You can go to RoyCollin.com. Today, my guest, we actually met a few months ago on Lunch Club, had a fantastic conversation, and he was in Holland at the time. I believe an American citizen originally. Yeah, I'm getting the nod here. And he was telling me that he was going to the border to help. So we're getting an update on the front line. So please welcome Curtin. Hey, thanks, Roy. Appreciate you, uh, your patience trying to schedule this call with me. <laughs> well, I mean, just to let the listeners know, because we had this schedule a few times, but there was actually a med- medicine that was delivered. And, you know, you're in charge of a team that's doing that. So, I mean, that's totally understandable. Yeah, we we had um, I was in Ukraine for our original uh, schedule scheduled call, <clears throat> and of course, full of meetings, trying to work logistics, getting supplies in. You have to meet people when they're available, and then we rescheduled, and then there was a, a shipment uh, of medicine that needed to be offloaded, uh, and then can we push it back thirty minutes? Okay, but then it takes two hours, and and then today, and uh, yeah, it's it's just. You, you shouldn't even use a watch when you're over here <laughs> because there's there's an endless stream of things to do and you just do one after the other until you're tired and then you pass out and you do it again tomorrow so uh it has been hectic trying to trying to put down a time but we're finally here and we did it so that's that's a great success <laughs> so i suppose we we'll start why did you decide to go to the border yeah, it's a, it a bit weird, actually. <clears throat> um, I was actually having a lot of nice momentum in the Netherlands. Uh, I had gotten my my residence visa. I was working. I had my own companies, and things were going well. Um, I was looking forward to a year uh, without COVID, so to speak. You know, a summer with festivals and enjoying Europe. And I was really, really on board with that uh, for the future. <clears throat> and then when the president Zelensky made the call for anybody to come help i started to have a few sleepless nights and i I couldn't really shake why i was feeling that way so i figured i could help from the netherlands um and not disrupt my own life too much i started to help uh, military veterans from europe get to the border to volunteer as um in the foreign legion as soldiers so i was organizing with the hague Ukrainian embassy, uh, trying to get some information on the internet to the right people and all of that. And the more and more that I got involved online, the more I kind of felt I needed to to do something more. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I made a list of reasons why I should not go. Um, but every time I tried to use logic, I couldn't sleep well. I was getting sick to my stomach. And finally, one day I just told myself, nope, you've got you've to quit everything. You've got to go over there, at least try. And if they don't need you, they'll they'll let you know and they'll send you back. So <clears throat> maybe I was going to come for two days or two weeks or whatever. But now it's been, uh, heck, it's been almost two months. And it looks like it, it's going to be a lot longer. So I don't really, don't really know why I came. But as soon as I got here and I started working, I definitely know why I'm staying. So that's, uh, that's more important, I think. <laughs> Yeah. So I suppose, I mean, you might as well tell us what's going on because, you know, we're all hearing different things in the media and I'm I'm looking at both sides. So I've actually had a guy from Russia who has a Ukrainian uh, wife. So, you know, because no biased media. So I'd like to know what's really going on there. Yeah. um, The day after that you and I uh, talked when I was in the Netherlands, I had a, a client from Moscow and his wife is Ukrainian as well. So we were we were chatting about, you know, things and I've got friends on, on both sides as well. I've been to Russia. I've been to Ukraine uh, before this. <clears throat> um, and I'm actually not watching the media. So the last two months, I'm not really I don't know what the BBC or CNN are saying about these things. Um, even last night, I just had a short catch up call, uh, a buddy of mine from university. And I told them about the, the refugee center here being mostly children, women, and uh, old folks because the men are not allowed to leave uh, if you're 18 to 60 years old. And just, and just on that note, because I saw in Ireland, they've basically opened 
open up one event center where where I'm from, from the you know the county I'm from, and I saw men that were actually of military age that were there. Yeah, there are exceptions. Uh, I I know Ukrainians who are in Poland right now, uh, running supplies, crossing the border back and forth, back and forth. I know Ukrainians that are, um, you know, have been raising money online, and they have a certain social media presence. And they can get some permission to go talk at some event in Spain or Croatia or something like this to <clears throat> raise money. And of course, there's a risk that they will leave and not come back. But it's not like every male inside of the country is fighting. They still need to people working at petrol stations and grocery stores. And, and they have architects and artists and you know taxi drivers that are not in the military. Um, but... Yeah, as a general rule, if you're 18 to 60, you can't just wander out of the country uh, without some kind of paperwork and explanation and approval and all this rigmarole. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that, that was I thought that's common knowledge because everybody who crosses the border and deals with Ukrainians here knows that. But my American friend said, no, the media is saying it's it's different and the media is saying this and that. So I, I, I just don't want to get involved in, uh, in you know, that side. I'm happy to share what I'm seeing uh, exactly. from inside of Ukraine, from outside of uh, Ukraine, with the Ukrainian families who are talking to me. Um, and basically, <clears throat> just, just like any other war, I mean, look at, look at London in World War II. Uh, the Germans were bombing London. Did everybody leave? Did they all go to Ireland? Did they all go to America? No. They stayed but, in London. But, but, but what we didn't see is other leaders going to Kiev to have a photo <laughs> shoot. Like, that is weird. <clears throat> yeah, that was a bit strange. I was, I was in Western Ukraine when that happened. And I was meeting with a warehouse manager. And he would, he would get out his phone and show me, like, hey, look who's in Ukraine today. Or like, oh, here's Angelina Jolie. Here's Boris Johnson. Here's, like, oh, okay. <laughs> and um, I mean, it's it's nice, I guess, to to show people that it's somewhat safe uh, to come inside. It's not a it's not a horrible Mordor, you know, fire breathing dragons and stuff. Um, in fact, most of the volunteers from the Polish um, refugee camps that end up going into Lviv in the west. Lviv is paradise. It's, it's, a, it's a resort compared to what we're dealing with here on the Polish side. Because the Polish side, it's these small, small, small towns that have been completely overrun with volunteers and refugees. So <clears throat> you go to buy a, a, a smartphone at the local electronics store. Sorry, we're sold out. <laughs> what? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, you don't have any smartphones? <laughs> like, yeah, we, you know, we're a small town of a couple thousand people and you've got you've got three thousand volunteers needing to buy an extra phone You're like wow so this side is really kind of um overrun uh supplies we just buy everything from the local shops but then you go to lviv they've got about a million people now old architecture fountains oh it's a beautiful city house. i actually i went on a holiday be before yeah, it is a beautiful it, city yeah they've got the hills they've got the churches it was easter time everybody was you know the bells are ringing and there's tours going on. You see a tour of, you know, people going through. So, <clears throat> you know, you had the air raid siren going on. And outside, there's a man dressed as a donkey taking photos with tourists. And it's, <laughs> you know, it's a little bit I, odd. I, I'm assuming it's actually Ukrainian tourists because I wouldn't think of many, like, yeah. Polish or any other nationalities actually wanting to go to Ukraine at the current moment. Well, because the majority, I mean, I don't watch the news either, but I'm like, we're seeing a lot of stuff with different pictures. And I've seen a lot of lies as well, because they were showing pictures of Beirut and everything, pretending it was the Ukraine. That's the problem. And that's coming from the likes of Sky News and others, you know, they're, yeah, yeah. May, you mm. know, but we're all aware think, of the media, you know, corruption. I think, I think there's a rush to be first. Right. Yeah. Uh, in the last couple of decades, you don't have to be right. You just have to be first. Um, and they care about where you get your news from. So if, right now, if I want to close my laptop and open my phone and find out what news is, you know, what's the latest on the war, which site am I going to choose? And if it's the site with the most exciting maps and pictures and, and blood and rockets, maybe that, that attracts people from a certain generation. So. Yeah, it's a shame. And that's that's one of the reasons why I've just kind of 
kind of turned off. I get my news from people who are coming out and saying, I just came from Sumi yesterday. Oh, what's it like since, uh, you know, the, the, the army has taken, taken back the, the territory? Oh, it's like this. It's like that. And they have photos on their phones. You know, here was the rocket that hit my village. Here was the rocket in the sky as it went by like this. And you're seeing the actual <clears throat> uh, footage. So when people say, oh, it was a nuclear warhead, be like, no, no, it wasn't. <laughs> uh, but every, every, every exciting kind of conspiracy or, or you know, dramatic event has, has crossed through, uh, through the community. And the people that are busy on the ground, they just ignore it because, you know, we've got to, we've got to deliver medical aid and, and food, for Christ's sake. Like food, you, you eat three times a day if you're lucky and people are running out of food soldiers citizens they're some of them are eating pigeons some of them are down to one meal a day some of them get a supply at, uh, sent to their town and then no supplies for two weeks so there's extreme rationing going on in some of these places and sometimes when they do get food you know it's a <clears throat> it's like a whole box of tea because it's labeled as food, food and drink. Well, how are you going to win a war with 180 soldiers eating tea, you know, so to speak? So that's that's where us in the supply chains, we really are trying to all hands on deck. Um, we, we've in the, in the last two months, we built up a system that's really starting to work now where goods are delivered to Poland or Romania. We, we, we break them down, we repackage them, we organize the trucks, we get the fuel costs, we have people paying for the fuel, uh, we cross the border, we've got the paperwork, we've got the drivers, we've got the hubs, the warehouses, locals are helping out, the post office is helping out, trucks are being repurposed, individuals are driving their own cars, people are spending their own life savings on fuel to, you know, in the towns and cities, we're getting stuff there. But now what's drying up is all of the global support and the global aid. So we can't, we can't serve Ukraine if our warehouses are empty. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> so that's why I'm doing stuff like this is I can cut out 30 minutes or an hour of my week to try to say something to the public and say, look, just because, you know, the Russians are moving back over here or Ukraine has taken back this city or that town doesn't mean that people have food and that people have medicine. Um, doctors need surgical tools that they just don't have. And you can't, you can't use some pliers as a scalpel. It just doesn't work, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> so and what, what's the infrastructure like then? Because I'm getting mixed information as well. Like the airports, were the airports bombed or are they operational? Is, is there, like, I mean, I, I believe that there's internet and everything, which is kind of strange in a yeah. war situation. Yeah, internet's, internet's there. Um, I know of no flights going in or out. Um, I don't know if that's because it's not allowed or if it's just too dangerous. But the, were, were the airports bombed or are they still up? Like, I, I know they have probably no fly zone, but like, are they actually still okay, the, the airports? <clears throat> there, is, there is a runway in Odessa that I've been hearing a lot about from uh, both Ukrainians and from the volunteers who cross over the border often that the, the runway is not usable. Uh, not that they were using it anyway. But that uh, if they wanted to start using it, it's not usable. Uh, I know there's a there's you know, um, but I, I think there's a whole group of people who focus on this stuff, you know, like <clears throat> not logistics, not doctors, not um, people taking care of refugees and giving them psychological support, uh, not the people taking care of rape victims. Those people are all busy doing their stuff, and then there's a few volunteers maybe in berlin and london that are focusing on uh, information and validating verifying information like that so <clears throat> there's a guy here who gets his information from a guy who tries to verify things and if i am curious i'll talk to him and say hey you know are the trains running here can you use a train or or not because websites are all out of date even if it's 24 hours 48 hours things change quickly um, but to be honest, like I said, they weren't even using the airport. So it's just a matter of 
do we need to rebuild it after the war or not? Um, because right now, food, you know, if, mm. if people want to talk about something, I'm always encouraging them to talk about food. Because if we can feed these people, they can stay alive. Yeah. And then next thing is medicine, uh, medical treatment. If they get injured or sick, you know, if you have diabetes and you're in the East, in Kharkiv, your insulin only lasts one month. And if the pharmacy is not getting restocked, where are you going to get your insulin from? Um, and you don't want people to go into comas that then need more medical treatment. You, you know, you're going to try to do preventative medicine. Um, so even if there's not another single rocket that's fired in, even if the bullets stop today, we're still going to need lots and lots of food and lots and lots of medicine for the next couple of months. <laughs> so <laughs> I keep telling people well, like, like when you said, I mean, because obviously, because I know, like, you know, I have friends that are diabetics. I know, I know how dangerous that is. Yeah. But if we look at the, the big pharma, like they're making record profits because of what they're, you know, forcing people to take, like, surely they're able to provide that without having to get the, the, the funding for that. Or what's the situation? Are they, do they need to be paid or are they actually donating uh, the, the medicine for, for those affected? It's, it's a mix of both. I mean, I, I'm diabetic as well. I got my, uh, my stuff here. And <clears throat> we had a few refugees that came through, 12-year-old, um, 16-year-old type 1 diabetics. And uh, they don't have their, their insulin, so I, I give them some of mine if it's the same prescription, you know. And <coughs> it's rough to see that because it's just lucky that they bumped into me, you know. It's just chance. Sorry. <coughs> There's also a lot of disease going around. <clears throat> um, yeah, so you might, like, what? how <coughs> long has it taken people to get across on the border? And when they get there, are you trying to place them or what's the kind of everyday life? Because... You know, sure. most people aren't seeing that. I'll, I'll, I'll answer the, uh, the pharmaceutical one first, and then I'll yeah, jump into the refugee uh, timeline. Um, so with pharmaceuticals, it's a mixed bag. Um, you have your pharmaceutical manufacturers who already have deals before the war uh, for delivery to clinics and hospitals and pharmacies and all these other places. So what's happening is some individual people are donating their medicine uh, let's let's say over the counter, like you know, cough syrup and uh, uh, ibuprofen and things like that. And then we have doctors that are writing prescriptions for uh, aid uh, that are here to help out. So we'll get a small car load, all this medicine from a couple of German doctors, for example. Um, and then there's th there then those are those are paid. You know, people are are buying this with a prescription written for the war. Then we have some donations from uh, European or, or you know, foreign hospitals, uh, clinics and things like that, especially after all the cases uh, of, of, um, of rape. <clears throat> A lot of the STD medication and uh, morning after pills and things like that were, were in great need, uh, great demand immediately after some of these territories were reclaimed by the Ukrainian army. <clears throat> there were lots of women and girls in need of, of these things. Um, so <clears throat> many, many different people are donating or, or selling at a discounted price. But now we're to the point where we need recurring donations that the supply chain can rely on. We're having data now from the Ukrainians that say these regions require you know, these medications this is a three-day supply, seven-day supply, 90-day supply, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the math models and everything. So we can actually go to America or to the UK or Australia and say, hey, we need this in the next three months. Like, can you give it to us? Or if we have to buy it, what will it cost? So that we can uh, get our donation arm to raise that money for those pills. <clears throat> because it's... It's not good to have all of us spread so thin. Like I'm trying to load a truck. I'm on the phone translating something with a guy in Kiev. Uh, I'm trying to confirm a driver for somebody. At the same time, I'm handing out shampoo to refugees. At the same time, I'm trying to fundraise with California. What? You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not the way to do it. You got to have specialists and that they can get really good at their jobs. So 
the issue that a lot of the supply chain people were facing is that we were building a, a chain between warehouses and demand uh, between Poland and Ukraine. And then we ran out of money. We ran out of supplies. So now we all have to turn around and look at the world and say, all right, what do you, you know, it's okay to say no, but just tell us, what are you giving us? And can we rely on it? If not, we'll look somewhere else because we, we need answers. We, uh, yes or no are good. Maybe not so good. <laughs> you know, just, just tell us, tell us what you're going to send. Tell us how much it costs and we can start to work on it. And like with the people that are there, then is there a system in place to try to place them? Because I know I have friends that have actually taken in um, Ukrainians and one of them then was able to f uh, find jobs from and, and you know, yeah. he, 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 had, he was sending some to Holland and different places. And I'm just curious, the people that are coming in. And how long is it taking them to come in now? Because, you know, you mentioned you went to Lviv. Like, I went during normal times, and I think the border took me nine hours at one stage. It was crazy. So I, I don't even know how long it takes to actually get through as well, like for, for both ye going there and the refugees yeah. coming out of it. Yeah, so um, different waves, right? Not every Ukrainian is going to have the same mindset. I think in the beginning of the war, uh, a lot of people left that had no interest in staying. It was a great excuse to leave. Maybe some people had been wanting to go to Germany for five years, but didn't have the visa, didn't have maybe the money or, or the opportunity. Now, all of a sudden, <clears throat> get out. There's a war coming. Free train to Germany. <clears throat> no question. Let's do it. So that was the first wave. You had all these people. Some were scared. They didn't know what the war would be like. They left. Um, but right away, after about the first... 10 days or 20 days once it looked like some regions were somewhat safe you started to see a lot of ukrainians go back <clears throat> people that might have left their homes knee-jerk reaction but then then been in touch with their cousin or their friends and their cousin said no our mountain village is fine and you know the russians are over there and la 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 so people started going back then you had the different waves of people crossing into poland let's say when a, a city was struck with a rocket for the first time, you might have some of those people leaving. <clears throat> and they would take trains, they would take buses, they would take cars. Uh, they were being organized in certain cities in central and western Ukraine, or they could just cross the border and we'd organize them in Poland. There's different refugee centers that try to keep people for one, one day, two days, three days. Um, they were staying for a couple of weeks, but it was turning into almost a, a resort because folks thought the war was going to end, you know, like, I'll just wait here until it's over. Um, okay. Everything was free. We had a lot of Ukrainian speakers. We're a couple of kilometers from the border. So their families are inside, you know, their, their sons, their husbands, their brothers. <clears throat> you don't want to go all the way to Portugal or Canada. And, you know, get all the way there. It's expensive. Nobody speaks your language. You don't have a job. You don't know anybody. And then the war ends. And now you have to get all the way back to Ukraine. A lot of people, the vast majority, would, would love to go back. You know, they want to stay close. They want to stay really close. They want to be comfortable. They want to speak their own language. They want to have as little dramatic change as possible. Because, again, those first wave, that first wave of people, those were the ones who wanted to migrate to Spain and this was a good chance for it <clears throat> um, but yeah the vast majority they are they're Ukrainian they want to go back um, so that's Poland's problem is that Poland is the default <laughs> stay yeah. here you know and Poland is bursting they have Warsaw's full Krakow's full you know Katowice all these cities the city centers are full and then all the the smaller towns are starting to fill up um, but it's really hard because you cannot force a family to move to Czech Republic or to Switzerland. <clears throat> it has to be their choice. So um, I know there's lots of British and French and Irish who are opening their homes, but there's nobody coming. And they're like, what's wrong with them? Why aren't they, you know, I will pay for their school. I will buy them a car. But they just, they, they don't want I mean, sure, yes, open your homes. The people that want to go there, you should take them. But if there's 250,000 British families ready, 
there might not be 250,000 uh, families of refugees who are ready to move to the UK. You know, and if there are, we're trying our best to get them there. But, you know, I think what would be much more attractive is to find people work. Right. Because they'll go for work. Uh, It may take two months, three months, six months, but at least they feel productive and they can be proud and they can tell their families, yes, I left Ukraine, but I'm working and the children are healthy and they're in school and we have a place to sleep and I'm working and I'm making money. And if you can make money in euros or dollars or, you know, whatever, that's great. Because when you go back to Ukraine, it goes a lot further. Um, what we don't want to have happen is sending Ukrainian families that are split up into an expensive environment where they don't work. They don't know what to do. They, they don't like to be needy, right? The culture is very kind of proud. Like you, you don't want charity. You want to be responsible. And it's hard, even on a, on a 10 hour journey, nobody asks to use the bathroom. Nobody asks for water. You know, and it's like, come on, guys, we're here to help. <clears throat> like, it's okay to, to ask for a couple of things. So there's a little bit of a culture. Um, and um, like, I, I know of uh, a few uh, friends here in Poland, because what happened is a lot of the Polish went to Ireland, England, Norway, mm-hmm. and a lot of the Ukrainians came here. And they are hard, they are hardworking. And, yeah. you know, they, they really connected in with the locals, you know, like they, they, they're lovely. The, the people that I know, I've never, had, I haven't had one bad experience with the Ukrainian. They're lovely people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we had a lot of, lot of great stuff here. I think one of the reasons is because the, the younger, you know, men are not here. Uh, my previous experience with refugee camps was mostly East Africa. And, you know, the stories that come out of there, you have full families. You have the husband, the wife, the kids, the brother, the sister, everyone's there. So a lot of the problems are between men, uh, 18 to 60, you know, two men fighting, three men fighting, two men arguing. Uh, stealing. Who is stealing? This man. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's not the six-year-old girl. It's not the 30-year-old woman. It's not the 69-year-old man that are causing the problems. So this has been very, very peaceful at the refugee centers comparatively. I mean, you've got people being polite to each other. You've got people uh, helping each other. It's like, wow, this is like paradise. There's Wi-Fi uh, in the refugee center. <clears throat> Uh, it's in an old abandoned uh, shopping center, um, but it's just, yeah, it's, it's very different because, you know, I guess the news, you see people fleeing a war zone, but in all honesty, a lot of these people that are here were told to come by their families, right? They wanted to stay, but their, their husbands or their parents said, no, you take the children and get out of here, stay close. And as soon as it's safe, come back immediately and we'll just restart our lives, you know. Um, and it must so. be because I know you're like close on the ground or like for families, especially children, when they know that their, say, their father is actually fighting there. Like psychologically, that must be terrible for them. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's one thing that most of the volunteers can ignore because of the language barrier. They can just kind of not see it. But for the Ukrainian and the Russian speakers that are working here, they're talking a lot. Uh, and of course, the younger kids don't really understand. But you've got the, the teenagers, you know, 14-year-old, and it's 10 o'clock at night, and they haven't eaten dinner. And so you try to offer them some soup and a sandwich, and they don't want to eat it. And they're just kind of kicking a ball around. And, you know, these are tough conversations because... The kid's going to say something like, oh, oh, next next weekend, my father and I had something planned, but now he's fighting and we're in Poland and I'm just thinking about my dad <clears throat> and they can't get updated information all the time. They hear rumors that some city was, you know, had rockets. And if that's where they're from, you know, it's a huge question mark. And how can they get confirmation that that everyone's OK? Um so it's it's not good, but that's war, right? It's never it's never nice. It's never good, <clears throat> and we we are not prepared for some of the the issues that really hit you face to face. You know, you have 
uh, a child without a guardian trying to cross the border and you say, well, where, where's the guardian? And you say, well, you know, the mother was sick and was sent to this hospital and the father was just shot. Um, so what's the kid supposed to do, you know? And where do we send them? And that, you know, we have to get the big organizations involved who take care of unaccompanied minors. And you got these volunteers who were, you know, I don't know, like working at Burger King in Dublin. And now they're in charge of, of a, like a 14 year old child uh, with a, with a sick mother and a, a dead father. And it's just really heavy stuff that they're not really prepared for. So we're trying to get more, um, how to say, like uh, qualified people on the ground. We're trying to set up systems where we can funnel problems to, to a certain uh, responsible party. Um, because, yeah, you know, you, sometimes you just hear people crying. And if you don't speak the language, you're just thinking, well, I wish I could do something for them. You know, I, I don't know what they're thinking about, but... Um, yeah, you have good days and bad days as the volunteers. Um, but the overall, the overall uh, feeling is support the people that are still there. And for the people that are not there, try to get them back as, uh, as, quick, as, as quick as they can. And just because uh, I know you, you have to get back to the things, uh, I'm conscious of the time as well. Like where everybody's sleeping, is it like in a mass open area with loads of beds or what's the kind of, yeah. yeah. That's it. The lights, that, the lights that you see that are on are on 24 hours for safety reasons. So people are, you know, just covering their eyes like this. They've got earplugs. The dogs are barking. The babies are crying. Uh, you know, it's, it's what you would expect when you have hundreds or thousands of people in the same room. Uh, you know, a lot of people snore, as you might expect. <laughs> um, and it's not, it's not paradise. <clears throat> like I said, it's a lot nicer than a lot of refugee camps around the world, but you still have limited resources, suitcases. If anybody's listening and you got a suitcase, please send it here because these people have their whole lives in a couple of grocery sacks that rip on the bus. <clears throat> and now they've got, you know, they've got summer clothes on one shoulder, winter clothes on the other, and they're being told to get onto a 26 hour bus ride. And they're like, where am I going to put all my stuff? And, you know, we get a suitcase, we give it out. Uh, like we need more suitcases and we've been we've been calling up people for six weeks like send more suitcases buy some suitcases <laughs> so it's the funny stuff that you run out of that people don't really think about and like i think the majority of people have a suitcase in their house mm. that they could donate because yeah, we all have too much stuff like so, so i i suppose what we can do is you can write you can send me exactly what you need and the different addresses and i'll post that both on the audio and the video so that you know anybody that can actually help can you know see. yeah that'd be great and and maybe um because <clears throat> of course needs change i mean suitcases have been uh, the number one for a while but uh, as far as medications you know we'll get we'll get a, a few thousand people with stomach issues and then we'll get a few thousand people with intestinal bugs and uh, then it's the throat medication so we'd like to find a way, and we're willing to work with uh, the listeners, if you guys have suggestions, you know, what's the best way to keep the world updated? Because right now it's just so fragmented. You know, there's a thousand lists of what people need. Which one do you trust? Um, so I don't know if there's any, any collaboration or coordination out there, but we'd be happy to have a full-time volunteer just working with somebody on your end, updating a list every day everything from toys and clothes and medicine and food and shoes and bags, uh, even crayons, like uh, children's books in Ukrainian, you can buy them on the internet and have them sent here. Uh, and when books are donated in Spanish or English or, or Chinese, the pictures are nice, but the kids don't know what the heck they're saying. <laughs> Just yeah. they don't speak those languages, you know? So there's loads of ways that people can help that cost very little money but we're happy to share with, uh, with people how to do those things. So if you guys have um, a method, uh, yeah, let us know. We're, we're busy, but we're not too busy to think of a better system um, because we've got, we've got hundreds and hundreds of volunteers and we've got thousands of people to take care of. And um, yeah, we'd love to do it as efficiently as possible. <laughs>
Oh, brilliant. And what we can do as well is like, uh, you know, maybe perhaps in two weeks time, do another kind of short one. And, but anybody that has questions as well, and then you can give me an update of kind of the latest yeah. thing, because, uh, you know, as you say, everything is changing constantly. And, you know, to be honest, I, I, lo- I love the, the conversation and what you said about the different things, because, you know, we're getting different stories on the me and it's great to, to hear things on the ground. And I know yeah. personally, because mm-hmm. one of my friends, the, the, their house, and I'd done a show on it, just about a 10 minute one, their, their house was actually uh, bombed and they had to come as is the kids and the mother. So I know it is happening. Like, and, and the more that yeah. we can help the people that are there, like what you said, a few different things. So you can, you can send me the list on or, or the way we contact each other and i'll make sure i put it out to, to today is saturday i put i laid it this, this evening and i put it out tomorrow so as soon as you send me the information i'll make sure that it's all is included it's it it saturday time. already <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't even know the month at this stage like <clears throat> it was really confusing because we had two easters as well <clears throat> so you had your your catholic easter and then your orthodox easter a week later and people were like, didn't we already do Easter? <laughs> you know, that kind of confused. <laughs> and I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's a different calendar. It's a different calendar. But people were like, oh, I've been working so hard. I just don't even know what day it is. You know, I could have sworn we did Easter. <laughs> yeah, well, thank, thank you again for, for finally being, <clears throat> you know, able to take my call and be patient with me. Um, yeah, it has it has been nice. We're gonna do a couple loads tomorrow. We're head, we're we're sending things out to Kharkiv. We got stuff down to Zaporizhia. Um, yeah, looking to keep moving everything east. So, yeah, it's uh it's good. It's good that people care. Um, but yeah, we we're just trying to fill up the warehouses so that we can do our jobs and uh, supply people with what they need to to live. Uh, so thank you again. It's it's an important issue. And um, yeah, I'll, like you said, I'll probably see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, perfect. Listen, thank you very much, Carl. Thanks, Roy. Yeah, yeah. So um, this will be up on the audio and the video. So please give us a thumbs up, five star rating and share with your friends. I'll also have the links for where, where you can send stuff to help and maybe an account as well that if you're going to give a donation, we might find a, an account that's actually safe because I know there's a lot of fraudulence going on there. So we'll make sure that it's going directly to the, the center. And um yeah, so if you have questions for next time I'm getting curtain back on, I'll make sure that I'll cover them. So you can write to me on awakeningpodcast.org. There's an actually uh, a, a contact form there. So until next week, take care.